Elizabeth was here researching her book uh, because we have a very full, very wonderful John Snow collection. Uh, and she spent a number of days here, I'm pleased to say. And lo and behold, one day she went to sharpen her pencil. And I guess I went to sharpen my pencil or something. Too. The day of the sharp pencil. The day of the sharp pencils. And, and, and being the nosy parker that I am, I said, Oh, so nice to see you here. What are you doing? <laughs> and she told me, and, and, and then we, we cooked up this exhibition. Um, and so she has very kindly agreed to come and talk to us about the show. And as you can see, John, our resident wizard, is filming it because we're then going to drop it to iPod so that other people can come in and with their iPod can have the benefit of Elizabeth's tour. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that, but I, I know it's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the zipper goes down or buttons go, just do one of these things. You know. <laughs> I thought if it's okay with everybody, we could start by looking at the outside wall for a minute or two and yeah. images for the outside of the show. Um, not because they're the best ones that we have in the show, but because um, they're archetypal, typical Jon Snow and Max Bates lithographs. Um, in that, the Jon Snow lithograph is very much color and texture position where he's asked himself how much color do I need to make one side of this space very strong and how much color do I need to counterbalance it so that space doesn't pierce all the way through to the back and still have a nice flat modernist picture um, with lots and lots of texture and overprintings. If you come a little closer you can see there's a netting very fine netting that's been added to the surface of the stone. You never know what you're going to find. You look really closely. There are imprints of all kinds of interesting little objects um, all throughout the show. Um, and in the, the uh, Max Bates lithograph, which is also a still life, um, you see quite clearly without too much analysis of what the differences really are. Here we've got very careful, clean, streamlined shapes. And if you're at all familiar with Van Gogh's irises, you might um, recall, or you might see, excuse me, that these have quite a strong family resemblance to those. So forms here are really created by lines, defined by lines, more than they are by color. Um, and that, that's the kind of introduction that we wanted to make visually um, to match the title of the show. But because um, art is way more complicated than language, um, there are exceptions to this. Uh, Max Bates as the linear artist, Jon Snow as the color artist. Um, they're very interesting exceptions, and a lot of them really reveal how much the two of them are looking at each other's art um, in 1957 and in the following decades. Lots of interesting people here. Artists are very sophisticated. Um, Maxwell Bates traveled a great deal in Europe, went to New York to study with the German expressionist painter Max um, Beckman. <clears throat> um, John Snow also traveled all over the place. They were both interested in theater, in literature, in drama, um, as were a lot of the other artists that were here in the 1950s. Um, and the cooperation between artists was a very important um, thing at that time. Um, not simply to, um, the Allied Arts uh, Center was a meeting room for artists to talk, to exchange ideas, to um, plan exhibitions from other places, um, and so on. So there was a lot of um, help and support within the community, um, as, as there is in any um, city where the arts are really important and really strong. So, um, so we have more or less here. Uh, Maxwell Bates on this side of the room, John Snow on this side of the room, um, and very generally speaking, uh, there's a lot more experimentation here than the John Snow side of the room. In 1957, 
when this show was first um, organized. Maxwell Bates was a very accomplished artist. He was well respected, not just in Calgary, but across Canada. Um, in Britain, he had been recognized, his art had been recognized by some very prestigious British critics, um, including Clyde Bell, who's a may recognize. Um, and he was the, in a way, the, the mentor of John Snow. And I think it's fair to say teacher, too, at, at an early point. Um, but because he was more accomplished, he was also more set in his ways. So I think it's fair to say, to some extent, um, Maxwell Bates was making lithographs in order to make them fit into his own way of doing art. Whereas John Snow, more of a beginner at this point, was making lithographs to learn how to be an artist. So the lithography press itself was really one of John Snow's teachers, to put it in that way. Um, and he didn't quite know what he was going to do with the lithography press at this point. Um, he and Maxwell Bates had discovered the lithography press. You may have heard the old uh, chestnut anecdote here 10,000 times, but they discovered the press um, in pieces in Calgary um, because the um, Western Printing and Lithography Company had decided upon a new modern way of printing commercial um, labels and so on and thought, well, there's no use for this old thing, and they chucked it. And um, Max, uh, John Snow was looking for a new method of printmaking and happened upon this so-called piece of junk, which he revived, brought back to life, and um, you see the results here. So the lithography press is a, is a, is the, is a character in the, in the play here. If you look at, for example, this lithograph by John Snow, four figures in it, see a style which is very, in a way, similar to uh, Bates' style in that the figures are very carefully outlined. There are distinct, cleanly separated areas of color and so on. Um, and it's a very much a contrast to, and we'll, I think, walk down there in a minute, it's a very uh, much a contrast to the mother and child image, which is right down there at the end, um, which is very much Many of you may know this, uh, a lithography stone is a large, heavy object, and it's not a perfect geometric object. It, it is not a, a factory-made object. So there are wiggles and squiggles and little chips in the corners and so on. So um, if you, like John Snow did, put a piece of lithography paper over the whole stone, um, you end up with an image that's got a little irregularity. Unlike a lot of printmakers, um, Snow liked to go right to the edge of the stone. He didn't have a perfect little piece of paper in the middle of the stone. So there are a lot of little chance elements that come in to printmaking, <laughs> particularly to John Snow's printmaking. Little bumps and little edges and little places that color goes that you didn't quite plan, but that you know are nonetheless look very interesting, all become part of the finished so the paper is on the stone, the color um, is, is uh, on the stone, and the roller goes over the paper. The paper picks up one color and then another, and then another, and then another. I have a mathematical chart, which is, I feel, scientific for how this photography process works. Very sophisticated. Um, Maxwell Bates traveled a great deal in Europe, went to 